once sealed, always sealed. You know, we've heard once saved, always saved, and there can be some confusion on that. Um, but biblically, when we look at it, once sealed, always sealed, once you are sealed with the Holy Spirit, once God has sealed you as his, there's absolutely nothing that can happen that can remove his seal. And, and so we can trust that we belong to him. And it's not about us. It's not about our righteousness. It's about Jesus's righteousness. Jesus is God. He's the only one that can save us. And he has saved us. And so uh, we can become Jesus who knew no sin, committed absolutely no sins. He became sin so that we who are not righteous can become the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. And so there is no one that's righteous, but we put on Christ righteousness. And that's how we are born again. And that's how we have salvation is because of what he did on the cross. And he came and he died for us so that we can be with him. And Jesus is the only way. Jesus didn't say, I am a way. He says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. No one comes to the Father except through Jesus. He's the only way to a relationship with God. And so we realize this, we call upon him, and we repent. We turn from our way to his way, and we become something new. We become a new creature. And so today we are going to look at Purim, and how this feast is also a prophecy for us today. And so we, we look at the feast of the Lord as they come through, and this is not a one of the major seven feasts of the Lord, but this is a biblical feast that is described in scripture that also has a pattern that continues. And we'll see we're right in the middle of a Purim pattern right now. So Purim began um, Monday, March 6th, the evening of Monday, March 6th, and it ends the evening of Tuesday, March 7th. So, um, but regardless of if we are in Purim um, or not, we, it's very interesting to see what's going on about the same time frame as these feasts. And so as we look at Purim, we're looking at a bride that is being prepared for a wedding at the beginning of this story, and we're also looking at a world and at a people that are being prepared to be handed over for their annihilation. And we're actually in that place right now. So right now here we have the bride, us, those that know Jesus as our savior. We're preparing for our wedding day. We're preparing for the rapture. We're preparing for the wedding supper of the lamb. Meanwhile, the earth is preparing for the tribulation. So there's a lot of types and shadows when we look through the book of Esther that are happening right now in our world. And so we, the bride, are being prepared to be face to face with Jesus. And Israel is being prepared for the tribulation. Remember, the tribulation is Jacob's trouble. It is a time for Israel to finish her 70th week of Daniel, to finish that time and be reconciled to God. So we look at these patterns. Every part of the Bible is always relevant right now. And that's what's so amazing about the Bible. It was written um, thousands of years ago by many different, different authors, but all of it was inspired by the Holy Spirit. And so it all works together so beautifully and it's all relevant right now in what's going on in our lives and there's no book no holy book no um no science book no history book that compares to its accuracy the bible is a hundred percent accurate and as we are becoming closer and closer to the end of this age we're seeing more and more just how accurate the Bible is about what the world will look at, look like at the very end of the age. And so God's a God of patterns and his holy days are always on time. And so he has his holy days 
that he repeats every single year, the purpose of his holy days, of his of his um, seven feasts of the Lord. And also we, we look at Purim and we look at Hanukkah and there's many um, parallels in there as well. These show his plan of redemption from the beginning to the end. And so right now we are looking at the Feast of Purim and the Book of Esther. And uh, so the phrase that that you hear in this and i think the phrase that we can all say every single day is that we have been prepared and we are living for such a time as this just as just as esther was specifically chosen to be placed to be planted in persia at the time that she was planted in order to and she didn't even know her purpose was to save her people. God put her before to save her people. Well, we're planted at such a time of this for a reason. God had us live at this pivotal moment on the brink of the rapture, on the brink of the end of the age for a reason. And so Purim and what's next? You know, we look at Purim, we can look at what happened before, and we see types and shadows of what is happening now. There's Nothing new under the sun. So what what does Purim have to do with what's next? And what does it have to do with what's happening right now in our world? And it actually has a lot to do with it. And so why do we look at God's holy days? You know, we are right now in this really pivotal time frame. There is exactly one month, exactly 30 days. From the full moon, that is Purim, to the full moon, that is Passover. And so there's exactly 30 days from Purim to Passover. And that is a pivotal time to be thinking about the cross, a pivotal time to be thinking about new life, our new life in Jesus, what Jesus did for us. And to be thinking about our redemption. Purim is a story story of redemption. And so is Passover. And so there's this link between the two. So God gave us all the feasts of the Lord. They are his feasts. These are not the feast of, of the Jews. These are the feast of the Lord. Now he gave them to the Jewish people. And he is going to fulfill them to the Jewish people specifically. But to say, oh, those are for the Jews and not to pay attention to them, you're going to miss out. You're going to miss out on the character and the plan of God that he gave. He gave his people. And the Jews are not the only ones that are his people. The church, the bride of Christ are his people. And if you love someone, you want to know about them. You want to know about their family. You want to know about who they are. And he has embedded his character all throughout the Feast of the Lord. So it is very important to follow them and to pay attention to what's happening in the world around them, too, because God has these patterns. And like we'll see today, they always play out. They always, they're always relevant. They they always matter. And it always makes sense. And so as we repeat um, the Feast of the Lord, they repeat his plan of redemption from Jesus's first coming, which was fulfilled in the Passover, unleavened bread and first fruits. Jesus died at Passover as the Passover lamb that was slain before the foundation of the world. He fulfilled the Feast of Unleavened Bread because his body is that unleavened bread that that leavens a picture of sin. He fulfilled first fruits because he rose from the dead on the Feast of First Fruits. And also we have Pentecost that was fulfilled with the Holy Spirit coming and not just God's word on stone tablets, but God's word on our hearts. And so we're looking to his return right now. We're looking for the signs of his return, which will happen after the seven year tribulation. And he's going to fulfill the final three feasts. He's going to fulfill the Feast of Trumpets, which is the coronation of the king. He's going to fulfill the Day of Atonement, 
which is Jesus' second coming when he comes down, touches ground on earth, and destroys the Antichrist army. He's going to fulfill the Feast of Tabernacles, which is the millennial reign of Jesus, dwelling in his presence and further a new heaven and a new earth. So all these feasts are going to be completely fulfilled. So there are only two, there are these two biblical holidays that aren't part of the seven feasts of the Lord that we just talked about. But they also hold these important lessons about God's character, and they're filled with types and shadows, and that's Purim and Hanukkah. And we've talked about Hanukkah. I think Hanukkah is an amazing picture of what will happen mid-tribulation. At Hanukkah, you have a picture of an antichrist desecrating a temple, exactly what will happen midpoint the tribulation. At Purim, you have this picture of the bride and this plot to destroy the Jewish people, which is what we have happening right now at this moment. So in both holidays, we have this demonic antichrist type. We have Haman in Purim, which we're about to about to get to know very well. And then we also have in, Han- in Hanukkah, um, the evil king, Antiochus. And so we have these antichrist types, this enemy that is bent on destroying the Hebrew people and the culture of the people. And we also have a hero who restores God's people against all odds. And so... And uh, here, I've already mentioned this, there are exactly 30 days between Purim and Passover. So these two feasts are connected. They have a lot in common. Um, One thing that sets them apart is Purim is the story of God rescuing his people while they're a minority in a foreign land. And so here they felt lost. They felt forgotten here. They had been in exile. They are in exile in Purim. Um, In in Persia here, they're completely in exile. They are second-class citizens, and they're hated. And it's a reminder that God is the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, even when there's no physical land of Israel, that he doesn't forget them just because they no longer have their land. And remember, for nearly 2,000 years before 1948, between AD 70, when Rome destroyed Jerusalem to 1948, they were a people without a land, but God was still their God and God still had a promise that he's going to keep to them. So it's a promise that God remembers his people in the smaller stories outside the grand redemption story, that he's still there, that he's still personal, that he still cares. So this is a reminder um, that's refreshing as we count down to Passover. Um, where we can remember, and God's people can remember God's promise to return them to Israel. He's not only there for the nation of Israel, but he's there for the individual people when they feel forgotten. And that's for us, too, because we can feel forgotten. We can feel marginalized, especially right now when we are such a minority in the world. People following Jesus is a very small amount of people right now. And so here we see these biblical patterns going on in the Feast of Purim. While Esther, the bride, is being prepared for her wedding, there's whole, um, there's whole beautifying treatments that she, that she goes through, um, making her beautiful for her wedding, preparing her. For the king. So while she's being prepared for this wedding, Haman, which is a political, political leader, really a political world leader, because Persia was was um, was basically a world was leading the world at the time. Haman is preparing for genocide. And so while while the bride is being prepared for her wedding. This evil leader and his scheme is to destroy the Hebrew people, to destroy the Jewish people. And we see the same thing happening right now. So our happily ever after story 
Um, when we see Jesus face to face, when we are at the wedding supper of the Lamb, what is the best for us, our blessed hope, is going to be the beginning of the tribulation and the final attempt by Satan to destroy God's chosen people. And so we see this parallel between the two, between the story of this of this bride, this Cinderella story, and at the same time, this backdrop of a plot to kill the Jewish people, to completely exterminate them. So Purim happened while the people were in exile, while, while they were not home not in their home. They were foreigners in a foreign land. And that was one reason why they were hated. That was one of the scapegoat reasons to hate them was because they were different. They didn't, they didn't do the customs of the land that they were in. They didn't, they didn't bow to the Persian gods. And we too are foreigners and aliens in this world, or at least we should be. If we're bowing to the gods of this world, then we have to wonder if we haven't completely assimilated into the world. God says, come out of her. Don't be part of this world. Really, being a follower of Jesus and being worldly do not mix whatsoever. And so we're foreigners and we're aliens and we're... And, and you see this more and more today. We're beginning to be hated and not tolerated because we don't bow to the things that the world is bowing to. And so the surrounding culture was different and was hostile to what a observant Jew believed in the time of Esther. It was hostile to it. You know, here everybody bowed down to Haman. When Haman came out, everybody bowed down to him, paid him the respect, except for Mordecai, except for the Jew, because he knew you're not, you're not supposed to bow down to anyone but God. And so he was hated because of this. And so the world and its idols are not going to tolerate that God's people will not bow to them. Believers and Jews in the end times will be hated. And we can we can see the Jews have kind of always been hated. Anti-Semitism is definitely increasing in these last days. We know when the tribulation begins, both those that do turn to Jesus during that time, the tribulation saints and the Jewish people, um, they will be hated. They'll, they'll be enemy number one during that time. So Purim started with an evil Persian leader who desired to commit genocide. And what's interesting right now is we have the same geographic enemy, Persia, is Iran. Persia and Iran, the exact same place, the same locational demons, you know, here. We, and we know from Ezekiel 38 and 39, that Persia, Iran, will be part of a coalition that comes against Israel to destroy her. We know Iran's threats here. They have, they have this gigantic missile. Okay. This is, this is brand new. They have this gigantic missile that has in Hebrew death to Israel written on it. They're, they're not, you know, they're very outspoken about what their plan is. And we know that's exactly what they're going to try to do. They are going to try to destroy Israel, Iran, Russia, Turkey, and other allies are going to go in to the northern mountains of Israel and try to destroy her. In Ezekiel 38 and 39, we see that this will happen. Iran is not just making idle threats. They are actually going to try to destroy her. Now, we know they're not going to hit her with a nuclear weapon, most likely, because we don't see that described in Scripture. It seems as though Israel, which is exactly what they're planning on doing right now, does stop this from happening because they are literally days away from this happening. Israel does appear to stop this from happening, and perhaps that is part of why they are going into the mountains to try to destroy Israel. 
Um, but we see that that is very much what they want to do. And they're very vocal about this. They are daily threatening to destroy Israel. Daily, they're talking about that very soon that they will completely annihilate the Jewish people. And so they're just days away from being able to do that. And that's what a lot of news right now is, is that Israel feels like they have to stop this before they are hit with a nuke. And the entire world is saying, no, 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 don't do that. And, and really the entire world, I, I think, is just hoping that she will be attacked before she is able to defend herself because we have this demonic hatred against Israel. And so why? Why does Satan hate Israel so much? Because Satan wants to call God a liar. Okay. Satan hates Israel because God promised that he would bring her back to her land, that she would never again be booted out of her land, that Jesus will come back while she's in her land and will be her king and will rule from Jerusalem. So if Satan can destroy Israel, Satan can destroy the people, then Jesus can't come back to them and he makes God a liar. And so he wants to destroy her. And that's why you have these world leaders that are demon possessed, that are, that are Luciferian. They want to destroy her as well. And so here they have the same Haman um, attitude, the same Haman hatred for the Jewish people. So Haman's evil plot backfired. And he, his family, and those seeking the destruction of the Jews were destroyed instead. And so you look at the picture of Esther, you see that there was this plot to destroy all the Jews, but it was turned over. Haman built these huge gallows in front of his house, okay? He built these gallows on his property for the purpose of hanging Mordecai the Jew. And he was so happy that he was going to be able to hang Mordecai the Jew on his gallows. Those very gallows are the ones that he and his sons ended up being hung on. So God ended up turning everything over on its head and God does that a lot and God will do that again in Ezekiel 39. Here are these these armies that are coming to destroy Israel, God himself is going to save them. Israel doesn't save herself. Um, America does not come to save her. No nation comes to save her. There's, there's, a few, there's a few nations that protest and say, what are you doing? But no one saves her. God saves her. God confuses the enemies. He rains down hell and brimstone. He has a huge earthquake happen. It is obvious it's God that does this and confuses the people. And they they die right there in the mountains of Israel. And everything is turned on, on itself. The very armies that are going to destroy Israel end up being destroyed themselves. And so we see this replay. And so Esther was strategically placed by God for such a time as this. And so have we. We've been strategically placed right now wherever we are. And it may not, it may not even make sense right now. You see this tapestry? <laughs> this, is, um, this is actually one that Corey Ten Boom used um, as an illustration. So I thought it was very timely considering she was you know, a, a Jew that had to go through concentration camp. Um, but we see here, you know, on the back side of the tapestry, it just looks like a mess. And sometimes our lives just look like a mess and we don't understand what God is doing, how all this works together. But one day we're going to see that the mess was perfectly designed. Every bit of it, there was no stitch that didn't have a purpose. Even though this way, it looks like it's just a mess. Everything made sense. And so here, 1 Peter 3.15. But in your hearts, set Christ apart 
as holy, acknowledging him, giving him first place in your lives as Lord. Always be ready to give a logical defense to anyone who asks you. The account for your hope and confident assurance elicited by faith that is within you. Yet do it with gentleness and respect. And so here, you know, we are to be ready to give a response when people say, how is it that you're hopeful and confident? How is it that you have peace when there is everything is so crazy? What is it that's different about you? And so in order to do this, we have to be peaceful. We have to be hopeful. We have to really have a biblical worldview in order to be able to be someone that can do this. And so for such a time as this, and this is Mordecai speaking to Esther, because she was afraid. She said, well, you know, she was hidden. They didn't know who she was. Um, you know, Esther was hidden and uh, she had hidden her Jewish identity. And so Mordecai told her, if you remain silent at this time, relief and deliverance for the Jews will arise from another place. You know, God will do what God's going to do. But you and your father's family will perish. And who knows, but that you have come to your royal position for such a time as this. And we have come to our royal position as the bride of Christ, as believers in these last moments of the last moments for such a time as this. He's saved us at this time for a reason. You're born for a reason. You're born again for a reason. And God orchestrated us for right now. And why is really between you and God. Ask God, what is my purpose? You know, what are you doing? Because there's a purpose for you living currently in his story. History is his story. All of this is his story. And we're living right at the moments, right at this climax point of his story. And so we were planted for now. You know, God chose us before the foundation of the world. God chose us too. God knew what we would do. He knew the decision that we would make. He knew that we would love Jesus, that we would belong to him. And he chose us. And so we've been planted at this point in history. We've been planted in the family that we're in. We've been planted in the workplace, in the neighborhood, all those things for a reason. And so here we have um, Esther 2, 6, and 7. Uh, this is, you know, Esther's people that have been carried away from Jerusalem with the captivity. As remember, um, the northern kingdom was carried away first, and then, and then Judah was carried away by Nebuchadnezzar. Um, he was, they were carried away later. So, whom Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, had carried away, and he brought up Hadasha, that is Esther. Now, Hadasha is her given Hebrew name, which actually means myrtle, like the myrtle tree. Um, and this is so, her uncle is Mordecai, and he raised her because her parents had passed away. So Esther's given name is Hadasha, meaning myrtle tree. But her name was changed to Esther to hide her, to hide her Jewish identity. And the name Esther in Hebrew means hidden or secret. And in Persian, it means star. And so she was concealing her Jewish heritage. And so she had a choice. She could, she could remain hidden. She could be the queen, remain hidden and let her people die. Or she could go to the king and tell him who she is and plead with him for her people. So Esther, like her name, she had a choice. She could continue to hide in her role. She could forsake her people, or she could, as a myrtle tree, um, she could signify God's promises to his people because the myrtle tree is used in Isaiah 41, 19, and in Isaiah 55, 13, to refer to God establishing his people in their own land. 
And so in order for them to be back established in their own land, they have to survive. They have to not be exterminated by Persia. And so Esther, for us, had this choice to look like the world. You know, we, we a lot like Esther today, we're preparing for our wedding, but we can look like the world. There's a lot of Christians that you, you wouldn't, you wouldn't know that they weren't the world looking at their Facebook, you know, maybe they have a couple Bible stuff here and there, but you know, there's a lot of Christians that you wouldn't know that they were, that they weren't just another person in the world. And so we have that same choice. We, we have a choice. We can remain hidden. We can hide in the world, look just like the world, or we can abide in God's law and we can live a life that's planted by him and a life that is to him. And that's going to look different than the world. You're going to, there's no way you're going to look like the world. If you're living to him, you're going to be peculiar, you're going to be different. And in him is the best and safest choice. It is the absolute best and safest choice in the moment it can be uncomfortable. It can even be scary. You may you may have trouble at your workplace. You may have family members that hate you and mock you. And, you know, you, there may be people that make fun of you. We've got brothers and sisters that their lives are in danger all over the world because they don't hide their identity in Christ. They're bold about who they belong to. And so here in America, probably the worst thing that could happen to you is you're, you know, mildly persecuted. But that's just right now. It's getting worse. Um, But God has us securely hidden in him. Now, that doesn't mean we hide in him and we look like the world, but it means that we belong to him and we're hidden in him. And we don't need to be afraid of what people will do to the outside of us. What we need to fear is the one that has the power to destroy our soul, our spirit. And so we need to make sure that we really know him. And so God has us. If you belong to Jesus, if you have put your trust in Jesus and you are a follower of Jesus Christ, then you're hidden in him. For all of eternity, you belong to him. And one day soon, he's going to take us to himself and we're going to literally be hidden with him for our wedding. During the tribulation, we're going to be hidden away in the bridal chamber. In the throne room, we are going to be hidden away while the tribulation is happening on earth. We'll be hidden away with him during that time. So another note on hidden, and this is a a major theme in the book of Esther, is this hidden. It's this understanding of hidden because God's name is hidden in the book of Esther. You don't see God's name once. You don't even see God referenced in the book of Esther. However, his character And his presence is very, very clear. Um, Today with the evil world, it can seem like God is hiding. It can seem like the world is winning. The enemy is winning, you know, because the enemy is so loud. And Christians have, you know, the Christians are such a minority. And it can seem like all is lost. But God's character and his presence is ever clear to those who know him. And to those who remain in his word, it's ever, ever clear. We are constantly reminded of just how real God is and just how amazing he is and how true he is because we see his word played out every single day. If you read your Bible, you can't help but see God in everything. But if you don't read your Bible, it's going to seem like he's hidden because the world and the devil and the flesh is so loud right now. And so what's next for the church? What's next for us? What's next for the bride? So we're being prepared for our king. So here we see Esther 2, 12, before a young woman's turn came to, to be presented to the king, She had to complete 12 months of beauty treatments prescribed for women and six months of oil, myrrh and six and six of months of perfumes and cosmetics. And so there she had a complete beauty treatment. We also are in this betrothal period as a church. So we've been in the betrothal period as a church since 
Acts 2. So for nearly 2,000 years, the church has been prepared and has been feeling during this time of the Gentiles. And so during this, during this time in the Hebrew wedding custom, the custom that Jesus was, was acquainted with, the Galilean custom that was during his time uh, before the wrath is a wonderful, wonderful movie that goes through it. it it's really cool. Um, the way everything lines up with the rapture before the wrath. And the bride would be beautified for her husband during this time. And that was her job. Her job was to be made ready for him. And that's our purpose. Our purpose is to be made ready for our husband during this time, to be made beautiful for him. And what does the Bible say makes us beautiful? How beautiful are the feet of those who bring the good news? You know, we are considered beautiful if we share the good news of Jesus with other people. The good news is that we are no longer prisoners. We are, we are no longer, we're, we're free now. We are free in Jesus. We're not bound to our sin, but we are free in Jesus. He has paid the price for us. We have been bought and we belong to him. We have been sealed with the promise until he returns and the Holy Spirit inside of us who we're sealed by delivers us to Jesus in the clouds. We have been sealed until that moment. And our job right now is to be beautified for him, to be ready for him. And that's that's all that we're supposed to do. Our job is to be about the kingdom of God. That is what we're supposed to do. And so what's next for the earth and what's next for Israel? So after Esther was made queen, after Esther was elevated. So this is that parallel, that picture of after the rapture. The sinister part of the story begins to really unfold. So God is sovereign and he is always ahead of the enemy's plot. There's there's nothing that Satan is trying to do that God doesn't know exactly what he's going to do. Um, I like the way J.D. Frog says it. You know, the devil is God's devil. There's there's nothing he can do. He can't. This isn't this isn't a chess match between, you know, two equals. You know, it's not like Jesus and Satan are going tat for tat. If, if it is a chess match, Satan is a toddler going against the chess master. There's there's no competition whatsoever here. Say um, God is always sovereign and he's always ahead of what the enemy is doing. And so there's there's a type here of the rapture. It's after the bride of Jesus is taken that the time of Jacob's trouble the 70th week of Daniel will commence. And so we have to be removed. We have to be elevated before that happens. Um, you know, think of it this way. We, we're the restrainer. The Holy Spirit inside of us is restraining the enemy from doing what he's about to do. And so as long as we're in this place, he can't go further. That's why right now everything seems like it's teetering, but it hasn't completely fallen over. The tribulation hasn't started yet, even though it just keep, almost feels like there's false starts to it uh, because we're still here and we're still restraining it from moving forward. So Esther 3, 1, after these things, after she was she was elevated, after these things, did the king promote Haman to the son of Hamath? I can't even pronounce that word, and advanced him and set his seat above all the princes that were with him. And so after we're raptured, the Antichrist is going to come to power. He is, he's, he's there. He's there right now in the works. He may be a name that we would recognize. He may not be a name that we would recognize, but it is after we're removed that he is promoted and he comes into power that he's revealed. And so these things was Esther's elevation, elevated to be queen. And then the evil Antichrist type Haman is promoted to power. And so we see here the first month, that is the month of Nisan. And that is what we are about to um, go into in about 15 days. Because right now, remember, we are 30 days between, between um, Esther, uh, between Purim, 
and Passover. And so between the 15th of the month, biblically, which is the full moon, full moon is always on the 15th of the biblical month. And so we've got about 15 days to the beginning of Nisan. So in the 12th year of King Iarxes, they cast a purr. And so this is where Purim comes from. It it's, means casting lots. And that is the lot before Haman from day to day and from month to month and from on, on, and to the 12th month, that is the month of Adar. So that is the month that we are currently in right now and the Hebrew month that we're currently in. And Haman said to the king, this is a certain, there is a certain people. See, he had already seen Mordecai. Mordecai already wasn't bowing to him. He hates the Jewish people because of Mordecai not bowing to him. There's a certain people scattered abroad and dispersed among the people in all the providences of your kingdom. And their laws are diverse from all our people. Neither keep they the king's laws. Therefore, it's not for the king's profit to suffer them. If it pleases the king, let it be written that they that they may be destroyed. And I will pay 10,000 talents of silver to the hands of those that have the charge of the business to bring it into the king's treasures. And the king said to Haman, the silver is given to thee and the people also to do with them as seems good to you. And so here we have this indifferent, just these people just not thinking nothing of genocide of an entire race of people. And there's nothing new under the sun. Right now, there are leaders that are saying that there are people that are not worth of anything. Christians, actually, people that do not want to play the world's games, people that don't want to go right along with the climate change um, religion that's happening, that don't want to go right along with a lot of the a lot of the scenarios and narratives that are happening. If you're not going to play that ball, then you're going to be a worthless person worthless people and we see as it goes into the tribulation you're not going to be able to make a living if you're not following the king's laws if you're not taking the mark of the beast if you're not doing what the world wants you to do and already there's this cancel culture to where if anybody bucks the narrative they can be canceled They can be hated. Everything is set up for that right now. We see it happening um, before us and don't think it will not easily turn on Christians because it's already starting to. And so we have right now um, Iran, Persia, the same. This is Haman um, from the movie, Esther. But we have already this, um, this happening where Here, Netanyahu is comparing Israel's defense against Iran, against this, against an enemy that's saying, as soon as we get a nuke, we are going to use it on Israel. And they are literally days away from having the nuke. And we have the world, the entire world. Here's the European, um, the IAEA, um, saying that a strike would be illegal. And so here we see the parallel there between Esther of needing permission, asking for permission to defend, for the people to be able to defend themselves. And having to go to the world power to say, please let us defend ourselves. Please don't just allow us to to be picked off. Allow us at least to be able to defend ourselves. So what's next for the earth? And what's next for Israel? Because remember the tribulation, it's all about Israel. It really is all about Israel. Israel's the prize there. And so we see the cold indifference here of when we look at Purim, when we look at the book of Esther, the, the Persian leaders had toward life. They were ready to, they were ready to over casting of lots, um, completely annihilate a race of people. And they weren't concerned about the people. They weren't concerned about any of that. And we see that that will happen during the tribulation. And and don't think it's not happening right now. But here we see in the Revelation um, 6, 5 through 6. And when he had opened the third seal, I heard the third beast say, come and see. 
And behold, and lo, a black horse, and he that sat on him, had a pair of balances in his hand. And I heard a voice in the midst of the four beasts saying, a measure of wheat for a penny and three measures of barley for a penny. And see that you hurt not the oil and the wine. And so we're, we're beginning to see a setup, a shadow of this right now um, with the way inflation is growing. Uh, but during the tribulation, it's going to grow much, much quicker. And so the people here during the tribulation, they're going to be struggling with war. That was the war horse right before this famine inflation, but the rich people are not going to be affected like that. He said, don't touch the oil, don't touch the wine, they'll be fine. Um, Klaus Schwab, you know, the um, their, the the World Economic Forum, the WHO, all of that, they're not going, they're going to be just fine, but it's the normal people um, that are going to be uh, greatly affected. So just as the weak king of Esther's day, um, he allowed evil Haman to control and manipulate him and therefore make a plan that would murder many people. Today, these evil plans are being set up and they're going to unfold during the tribulation. We have a lot of very weak kings right now um, that are being manipulated by really by Lucifer and everything that they're setting up right now is just going to play out during the tribulation. And so right here, we see the Biden administration um, is afraid that Israel will attack Iran nuclear sites without first consulting Washington um, because they want to stop Israel from doing it. Um, Israel has no friends. Israel has really no friends um, in the world right now. That's why God is going to be the one that protects her. Netanyahu, again, he's saying, I will do everything in my power to prevent Iran from acquiring nuclear weapons. And here, U.S. is concerned about a strike. Um, Russia and Iran have a secret nuclear deal that would allow uranium transfers to Tetron's illicit weapons program. Okay. Ezekiel 38 and 39, guys. Ezekiel 38 right here. Here we have the major players from Ezekiel 38 that will go into the northern mountains of Israel to destroy her. And they have a nuclear deal. So Iran can make um, the material for a bomb in about 12 days. And that was on March 1st. And so time is, is ticking away for Israel. To, Israel needs to do something to stop that day from coming, to stop them from having that bomb. And so Esther intercedes for her people. And the evil plot is turned against Israel's enemies. And so we see here she fasted for three days. She had um, other people fast with her for three days. She approached the king. She risked her life to approach the king. And she ended up pleading for her life and for the life of her people. And the enemy's planned, plan was turned on him. So Haman was hung on the very gallows that he erected for Mordecai. His estate is given to Esther and to Mordecai um, because of the prime minister, because um, and Mordecai becomes the prime minister. He became the right-hand man of the king in Haman's place. Um, and Mordecai had already kind of made himself known because he had protected the king uh, against a death threat earlier in the book of Esther. And so this seems like the happy ending here. You know, the, the bad guy gets his um, and, and it just it almost seems like the happy ending. But the decree to kill all the Jews is still in place and, it, and it's irreversible. Once a king has his seal. And this is interesting to note. The seal. Is irreversible. It cannot be removed. And and this is something kind of a side note, but sometimes we think about how we are sealed with the Holy Spirit. We don't have an understanding of what a seal is. Um, we might, you know, we might think sealed like protected or sealed like he's in us. And he still means seal is actually talking about a seal that is put on 
by the king and it cannot be removed by anybody but the king. And so we have been sealed until the day of redemption. We have God's seal on us. And just as that seal was ir- it, it could not be removed. It was, it was irreversible. So is the seal that's put on us when we, when we receive Jesus as our savior. Now, one reason why the rapture has to happen before the tribulation is the enemy has a counterfeit seal. The enemy has a counterfeit seal that he puts on his followers during the tribulation. The mark of the beast is his seal. And just as God's seal is irreversible, so is Satan's seal. Satan is not going to take off his seal off his people. And those who choose him, who say, I want to belong to you. I want to be your property. Put your seal on me. That's those who take the mark of the beast. That's what they're doing. It is irreversible. There is no redemption because they are knowingly taking his seal and becoming his property. And so it's important thing to remember when it talks about seal, how serious that really is. And so praise God. Once we're sealed, we are we belong to him and we've been sealed into the day of redemption. Um, but we that's that's one reason, too, why the seals can't. You know, we can't be sealed with the Holy Spirit, have be exposed to. The the Antichrist seal, you know, we would not we a Christian would not take it, period. But um, so we have here uh, there seems to be a happy ending, but that's not it. It can't it's irreversible. So that's that decree is still out there. To kill all the Jews. The decree is still out there. So what the king does is he gives he gives Esther and he gives Mordecai permission to write a new decree in his name and give the Jews the ability to defend themselves on Adar 13 and 14. That's what that's what we're coming out of right now. Adar 13 and 14. So he gives them this ability to defend themselves against these people that are coming to kill them. This decree says, we're equipping you, we're giving you what you need to defend yourself, which is exactly what Israel is asking for right now. Israel saying, we want to be able to defend ourselves from Persia. Just like we needed to defend ourselves from Persia in Esther's day, we need to be able to defend ourselves from Persia right now. So the king granted the Jews that were in every city to gather themselves together and to stand for their life, to destroy, to slay, and to cause to perish all the power of the people and the providence that would assault them, both the little ones and the women, and to take spoil of them for a prey. And so it was turned over. And the decree was turned on its head. And those that desired to kill the Jewish people ended up being the ones that were taken. So to celebrate this victory, Esther and Mordecai established the holiday Purim on Adar 15. And so this became the most joyful holiday in the Jewish calendar. And still today, there are parades. People dress up as princesses like like Esther and dress up um, as Haman. They have. You know, it's almost like a like a costume party. Um, And so it's still done today. But what's interesting is Purim this year in Israel's oldest city was canceled due to terrorist activity. And so we see this, that there's this change. Um, Ramadan starts at the end of March and there's this build up to an escalation to um, an attack on the Jewish people and war and it does appear that it looks like psalm 83 could um could begin very easily at ramadan and so we have this this build up of the war and, and it does appear that psalm 83 happens before ezekiel 38 and 39 so we have all of this building up so god is the same yesterday today and tomorrow and we see that you know, we see that as we look at the book of Esther, as we look at Purim, as we look at what's happening, there's nothing new under the sun. The enemy does the same thing over and over and over again. And God has made his promises and he's going to keep them. And so Jesus is the same 
yesterday, today, and forever. Hebrews 13, 8. Malachi 3, 6. For I, the Lord, do not change. Therefore, you, O children of Jacob, are not consumed. And over and over and over again, the enemy tries to consume Jacob, consume Israel, but they won't be because God has made a promise. And so the same God who saved Israel in Esther's day is going to do it again. Romans eleven twenty six. 26, when Jesus returns as king, all of Israel will be saved. So this is a reminder for us that God will rescue his people. God is not done with the people or the nation of Israel, and we're living in this set up time to the final seven years of Jacob's trouble. That's why Israel is so important to watch right now. We are witnessing this set up to God's miraculous deliverance of his people. And, And God will save Israel out of the tribulation. That's why it's also called Jacob's trouble. Alas, for the day is great so that none is like it. It's even the time of Jacob's trouble, but he shall be saved out of it. And the best news for us is that God is going to save us before the tribulation period. We, like Esther, are elevated beforehand, like like David. I I mean, like Daniel. In the book of Daniel, he's elevated before Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego go into the seven times fiery furnace. There's all these pictures of the rapture happening before the tribulation period happening in scripture. So 1 Thessalonians 5, 9 through 11. For God has not appointed us to wrath, but to obtain salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us, that whether we are awake or sleep, we should live together with him. Wherefore, comfort yourselves together and edify one another, even as you do. And so here the context is really key when we're looking for the rapture. And we talked about these verses before, but I think especially right now, it's important to be reminded um, for you yourselves. This is this is Paul from First Thessalonians. You yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. And we've talked about that thief in the night doesn't mean you're not going to know. It means you're supposed to be looking for when they shall say peace and safety, then sudden destruction will come upon them as travail upon a woman with child and they shall not escape. They shall say peace and safety and the same they will not escape the sudden destruction that comes. And so look at this. This is peace and security, peace and safety, peace and safety. They can't help but say peace and safety every single day. And this is peace and security in the world. EU launches new program to support peace, stability, and conflict. And so here we have um, peace and security all over the place. And the Bible said that that would be the case thousands of years ago and we see it happening right now almost 2,000 years ago the bible told us that that would be what would they would would say and they're saying it and so we are not they but you brethren are not in darkness that that day should overtake you as a thief you're not caught off guard we're not in darkness it does not hit us like a thief you are the children of light and the children of the day We are not of the night or of the darkness. Therefore, let us not sleep as others do, but let us watch and be sober. For they that sleep, sleep at night, and they that be drunken are drunken at night. But let us who are of the day be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love and the helmet, the hope of our salvation. And remember, we talked about hope. It's not like, oh, I hope so. It's It's an assurance. It's a solid. It's not a wish. It's a no. So we are not they, they, them. It's interesting, the whole pronoun thing. (laughs) They, them, they're the ones that are thrown. They are completely caught off guard and they do not escape. We, I want to shirt that says I'm a we, (laughs) you know, (laughs) my pronoun is we, I'm a we. We are watching for the rapture. 
we're not caught off guard. We know it's about to happen. We just don't, we don't know exactly when, but we know it. We feel it. We're watching for him. And watching for the rapture is biblical. For God has not appointed us to wrath, but to obtain salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us, what, so that whether we are awake or asleep, we should live together with him. Wherefore, comfort yourselves together and edify one another, even as you are doing. We are supposed to be looking for him. And if we are looking for him and we know him, we're not going to get caught. We're not going to be caught off guard. But the tribulation is going to come on suddenly. We see it coming on. It almost seems like it's taken. It's taken too long. <laughs> it's taken a long time. Why? Because we're still here. It's teetering as long as we're here. When they say peace and safety, notice they are all saying this right now. I've been saying it for years. And they're going to continue to say it until when they say it, it is the time of sudden destruction. Then sudden destruction will happen to them and they will not escape. We see in scripture that the rapture will happen when people are going about their daily lives. It's going to catch people off guard because it's going to happen in a relative normal. It's going to happen at a time like right now where People are so oblivious. They are willingly oblivious because there are plenty of signs going on. But fewer and fewer people see. It's like they are choosing blindness. It's very strange. Um, Jesus's words about this. But as of the days of Noah, so shall the coming of the son of man be. For in the days that were before the flood. So this is before tribulation, the days before the flood. They were eating and drinking, marrying and giving into marriage until the day that Noah entered the ark. And they knew not until the flood came and took them away. So shall also the coming of the son of man be. So we can deduct from Jesus's own words here that the rapture will happen when people are unaware of the coming danger. That is exactly the current environment. This sudden destruction means that prior to the rapture, the tribulation and the tribulation starting, most people will be willfully ignorant that the danger is coming. Most people aren't even aware of the 2030 agenda. Most people aren't even aware of what's going on and how quickly everything is being set up. Most people just have their head happily in the sand to all of that. And this, this was just yesterday. And this just, this article just floored me. New Pew Research is showing that an overwhelming majority of Americans, 96% of Americans do not hold a biblical worldview following COVID-19. 19 lockdowns. Now that shouldn't, it shouldn't really surprise me because I see it anecdotally like all over the place. It's driving me crazy that people don't see what's happening. But 90% of people do not have a biblical worldview. Why? Because they're not reading their Bible. How can you possibly have a political, uh, how, how can well, you, you can have a political worldview. That's the problem. Everybody's, everybody's watching politics. <laughs> but how can you possibly have a biblical worldview if you are not reading your Bible every single day? How can you possibly have a clue what's going on? And that's the problem. Most people don't have a biblical worldview because they're not reading their Bible. And I just employ you, please read your Bible. The word of God, the word put on flesh. Jesus is the word of God. When you read it, the Holy Spirit speaks to you. He guides you and he'll show you what's happening in the world. Please, please read it. Um, so some final thoughts here. We're going to soon be elevated to the wedding. We're going to soon be face to face with the word of God. We're going to soon understand these things that, that, that are tricky right now to understand. We're going to soon be in front of Jesus. That should be excites you, you're going to be in front of your king and your bridegroom. But the world 
is going to be going into the most difficult time. So we're going to soon be elevated into the wedding. While the enemy's plan is going to continue to unfold unhindered by the restrainer. See, we are salt and light. So as long as we're here, we are slowing down the decay. We are restraining the decay. We're restraining Lucifer's plans. We're restraining the tribulation from beginning. The Antichrist cannot be revealed because we're in the way. So what can we learn from Esther? Um, what we can learn, what can we learn from the Feast of Purim now while we're still in this place of influence? Because as long as we're here, we're still in a place of influence. We're still in a place of being useful to continue to restrain the decay. And the hope is to bring a couple more people on the lifeboat. And so we don't hide. Don't conceal your identity, but go full on into your identity. Um, you're about to see Jesus face to face. You don't want to be embarrassed that you didn't proclaim him to people. Be a myrtle tree. Be planted, not hidden, planted. And God is sovereign. He, he is completely in control of everything that's happening. There is nothing that's happening that is that is surprising him or shocking him and nothing that happens should surprise or shock us or should upset us that much because everything has to bend to God's will. And he told us what would happen. He told us that there would be great apostasy before the tribulation began. He told us that, that these would be perilous times that men would be lovers of themselves, that, that there would be such deception in the world. You know, he told us what it would look like before his return. And so he's sovereign. He, he, we should not be surprised that the world is decaying quicker, that there's fewer of us, because that's what scripture says it would be like. And God has planted you strategically for such a time as this, wherever you are, He's planted you. So stay the course and read his word and don't get distracted by all the deception. There's there's a reason the number one thing Jesus said was be not deceived when he was asked about these last days, because the deception is the number one thing to be aware of. It's very, very high and there's so much deception out there. There's no way to be able to not be deceived if you are not reading the Bible. And so, and read the Bible, not, not books about the Bible, not devotions e even. I mean, those are fine, but read the Bible every day. The actual Bible, not about the Bible, not jumping around, but read it Genesis to Revelation and then start again, Genesis to Revelation and see how many times you can read it before Jesus comes and gets you before he comes and gets us. And so um, thank you guys. That was Purim. And um, we will see what God decides to give us to talk about next week. Uh, God bless.